So why quantum information processing is interesting? Well, of course, you know, to physicists, it's, it's, it's exciting. We can play with quantum phenomena, we can control them, we can build new devices, new gadgets, you know, experimentalists love it. And then we can implement wonderful things that we are going to talk about, like quantum teleportation or quantum cryptography, where we can send information with perfect security from one place to another. And also, hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to build quantum computers. And um, then you may ask, OK, how about computer scientists? Why do they find this interesting? Well, the main reason why they find quantum computation interesting is because quantum computation redefines computational complexity classes. So computer scientists um, divide problems into easy and difficult. Well, we all do, of course, but you know they can also quantify it. So what uh, they do if they want to quantify problems uh, into those two classes, easy or difficult, is they look at the scaling. So they pick up an algorithm for a given problem, and then they apply this algorithm, try to solve the problem for increasing size of the input. So for example, take multiplication, that's your problem. You have a good algorithm for multiplication. So what you do, you apply this algorithm to, to one digit number, then you multiply to two digit number, to three digit number, and so on and so forth. So you put the, the size of the input as a number of digits. You put it on the horizontal axis. So let's uh, call it uh, input. So n is a number of digits. And then you look at the execution time. So of course, it grows as you increase the size of the input. And on vertical axis, you have this execution time. Now, when it grows like logarithmic, linear, at most polynomial function of the size of the input, say n squared, then computer scientists say, well, great, fantastic. This is a good algorithm. Man. It just, you know, the execution time doesn't grow too fast. We can handle it. However, whenever it goes as the exponential function of the size of the input, say 2 to the n, then computer scientists are not happy. Say, well, you know, we know how to solve the problem, but it's not an efficient way of solving the problem. So, and then they just draw complexity classes. They say, OK, all problems that we can solve on a deterministic classical computer in polynomial time, call this class P. Then, of course, you know, this is a subset of a huge class of problems that require exponential time to solve them. Now, then we look at, say, probabilistic model of computation, and we ask questions, OK, well, how about randomized computation, when you use randomness as an extra resource for computation? <coughs> Then computer scientists think, well, maybe, maybe that uh, they give us some advantage. Maybe the class of problems that can be solved in polynomial time on a probabilistic computer is slightly larger. That's actually not known. Many things in computational complexities are, are, are essentially not known. But uh, the class that is called BPP, that stands for bounded error probabilistic polynomial, may contain problems that, um, uh, that can be solved in polynomial time using randomness, but uh, we don't know how to solve them on a deterministic classical computer in polynomial time. Um, over time, there, was, uh, th you know, there were a few problems. If I were giving this uh, lectures you know, um, many years ago, I would probably tell you that there is a problem that is here, for example, testing whether a given number is prime. But over time, people found a deterministic algorithm. So the testing whether a given number is prime is now in P. So there is a remarkable migration of problems from BPP to P, but still we don't know whether those two classes are different so, uh, or, or, the, or the same. So it could be that BPP is equal to P. Nobody knows at this point. What we are interested in is another class, is a class of problems that quantum computers can solve in polynomial time. And this class is larger than BPP. So we call it BQP. That would be bounded error quantum polynomial time. There are problems in this class, for example, factoring 
of uh, large integers. So if we want to decompose a given number into prime factors, and if we increase the size of the number, it's getting exponentially difficult to uh, find those factors. And that is the case for any type of classical computation, be it deterministic or probabilistic. We simply don't know how to do it. Now, we know how to do it with a quantum computer. So there are problems that uh, plus and not known to be in BPP or P. And that's what makes computer scientists really excited about. They, they, they find it fantastic because <coughs> the, way define, the way they define um, difficult and easy problem somehow takes away any technological progress per se. If you think about it, if you build a faster and faster computer, that, that is not the way to take a difficult problem and make it easy. I mean, whatever scales exponentially will still scale exponentially, no matter how fast your computer is. In order to go from here to here, in order to make a difficult problem easy, all you have to do is to think. So that requires creativity. And that means that you have to just think about a uh, new algorithm, essentially. So then you may say, okay, then how come quantum looks like a technological progress? Well, not so. Quantum is really about giving you extra tools. This quantum interference, think about it as a sort of extra thing that you can use in constructing algorithms. It allows you to introduce certain set of instructions that only make sense for a quantum computer. Th th that set of instructions doesn't make sense for any classical computer, so therefore, quantum algorithms that you can create using this additional set of instructions can be inherently different. They may not have, or they do not have, a classical counterpart. And that is really what, what is exciting about the whole thing. 